Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, course three and four of our 2021 virtual Valentine's cooking class. Uh, we are going to double dip on this one a little bit. So Chef is going to walk us through how to produce the filet mignon au pois. And once that is in the oven cooking and getting delicious, uh, he is going to walk us through our chocolate chili mousse. So with that, Chef, you want to go ahead and take it away? Yep. Okay, let's go. Let's get to make steak au pois. Uh, pois that's being peppery steak. Traditionally, it's a, a French dish. Do it with filet mignon, but you can do it with another nice cut of meat, like a ribeye or New York. Basically, we're going to do two uh, our brandy cream sauce. Let's start. Uh, first, we're going to turn our burner, the oil, one or two tablespoons, in high heat. And let's go to seasoning our, our filet mignon. The thickness has to be a little heavy in pepper. Salt, a nice crust of coarse black pepper. The reason we coat it so heavily in black pepper is because a lot of that black pepper is actually going to fall off of the steak as you start to sear it. And that will actually help to flavor your sauce with the black pepper that's coming off of the steak. Now, we we'll wait a little bit more until it start to smoky point. Okay. But what are kind of cuts we can use it to do steak au pois? I mean, truthfully, for a steak au poivre, a poivre is really just a style, right? It's French for with pepper. So you can use whatever steak you love. Uh, a poivre is a, is a style that is, uh, it's been around forever. It is traditional French cooking. It's traditional French uh, steak preparation. So, you know, obviously, you know, for us in restaurants, we use filet a lot. Filet is very easy to work with as a restaurant. Everyone tends to like filet, but if you're a New York strip fan, a plop would be delicious with New York Strip. If you're a Delmonico or a Porterhouse, uh, you know, so even sirloin, uh, you know, it would be great. And the end result is this really great, really peppery cream sauce with a touch of, of brandy sweetness that really just adds to the steak. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, we can use this uh, cognac too. Absolutely. Uh, really good flavor. Okay, as you can see, I'm ready. Let's go and to it's smoking, so yep. we're going to go ahead and get this one started. Oh. That's delicious. And you can it smell works. it. You can smell it wow. right away. As soon as that steak hits the pan, you're going to smell that black pepper really starting to toast in the pan. That's what you're looking for. Now, you're going to cook your meat on your desired temperature. I recommend a medium rare, 130, 135 degrees. If you want medium, maybe 140, 141. That's the see. Nice. Hold the pepper, let's go to sear the other side, and let's go to put the oven at 350 for about 10 minutes. We can see right here on top, we have this really nice crust on top. That, that's what we're looking for, that really nice dark brown. The pepper you can see is toasted, and again, in, in our business, that's what you call my yard, right? We're looking yeah. for that really nice hard crust. Yeah, it's caramelizing all the sugar there. No? Caramelizing all the sugar, and what we're doing is we're yeah. trying to keep all the juices from the steak inside the steak. That's why you sear uh, to try to retain all that moisture because all that moisture wants to come out. So we want to make sure if you've ever seen a hamburger kind of bleed all over, that that's why. Okay, now we're going to put it in the oven. 350. Now. Let's do the side and do our dessert. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, our dessert is going to be blood orange choco chili chocolate mousse. We will start to do it our chocolate mousse first. Uh, can you help me to do the whipped cream? Absolutely. Okay. All right, so we're realists here at Belmont, right? We know not everybody has a blender, not everybody has a mixer. Not everyone has the tools that you may need at your house, but most people have a mixer of some sort, whether it's a hand mixer, uh, whether, you know, whether it's a blender. I always recommend using the KitchenAid. It tends to keep things a little bit cleaner, but whatever you have at home will work. 
Okay, so for any whipped cream, there's really only three ingredients. All right, we're gonna use heavy whipping cream, which we did provide in your kit. All right, we're gonna put that right in our bowl. Granulated sugar. Now, if you're not a granulated sugar person, you can use any type of sugar you prefer, turbinado sugar, uh, brown sugar, sugar in the roll. It will all melt, but for this, we like granulated sugar. It tends to come out a little bit more smoothly than your, uh, your larger pieces of sugar. And then our last ingredient for this is going to be just a little bit of uh, vanilla extract. Obviously, we like to use real vanilla extract. If you don't have that at home, we provided it for you for this one and you can certainly use imitation, it, it really doesn't matter. Now the big thing when you're doing the whipped cream, do not turn it on high, unless you wanna clean your kitchen for the rest of your Valentine's. Okay, so we wanna start it very low, all right? Let the blade spin, and as the blade's spinning in the cream, it will naturally start to thicken. You'll actually be able to see it. What you're looking for, what we call ribbons. All right, you're looking for ribbons in the top of the cream. All right, that means that that's naturally starting to emulsify, naturally starting to thicken. Once you get your ribbons, then you can start turning it up. All right, and as we start turning it up, you'll actually see it start to almost solidify. And then what we're looking for are what we call peaks. Okay, so typically when you're dealing with mousses, when you're dealing with whipped cream, you can have two stages, soft peaks, which obviously are gonna be, it's gonna be a nice, soft, free-flowing whipped cream and stiff peaks. So when you think of stiff peaks, think of like a meringue on top of a meringue pie, right? Those nice hard corners that stand straight up. So you can see already this is starting to thicken, so we're gonna turn it up just a little bit. As you start to incorporate more air into this, you're gonna see it continue to thicken. At the core, that's what we're doing. We're incorporating air into the whipped cream. We're making it bigger than it is by filling those, whipped, those cream molecules with air. So you can see the color is a really delicate brown. That's from the vanilla. Uh, you know, this is gonna end up being a much darker brown because we are gonna fold in chocolate ganache and chili. But in the meantime, and you'll see where, you can see the ribbons that I was talking about starting to form. We're getting these nice lines that hold their shape. And then as we pick up the speed, you'll actually see it start to take, change form again until it gets into almost a stiff, meringue-like, stiff peak. And that's what we're looking for when we make a chocolate mousse this way, because at the end of the day, as soon as you stop mixing it, it's gonna start to deflate. Okay, so we wanna get stiff peaks so that as we work our chocolate into it, and as we work our other ingredients into it, it doesn't turn into soup. So now we're at a good stiff peak. We're gonna turn our mixer off. A little trick for me. I always like to bring this down while it's on low to clean the actual whip off. And you can turn it up just a little bit, get everything off your whip. But this is our vanilla whipped cream. So this is gonna be our base for our chocolate mousse. Chef, you ready? Yep. Thanks, Max, of course. Now we're going to make our one chocolate. First, we need one cup of chocolate. When it starts getting a little warm, let's put one on our chocolate. The idea is melt it slowly. Put a little bit. Now we're going to stir it slowly until it helps to melt all the chocolate. As you can see, it starts to melt all the chocolate. At this point, let's go to add some chili. Good, you can see it's starting to melt in a little bit. Okay, got some chili here. Let's see, half tablespoon. A little more, maybe one. Depending on how 
spicy you like it but I recommend like half tablespoon nice smell and smooth Like nice and shiny are okay. I was ready to put it there. The bowl. I'll let it sit for a couple of minutes until getting a little cold and take more body. Okay. Nice. Let's just put in there. Walk it for a little bit. Check on our steak, but well, that's one. Yeah, let's see. So we know not everyone has a uh, a meat thermometer at home, and, and if you do, it might not be calibrated. So we can always nice. yep. So we can always learn a little trick. This is how I learned to temp steaks when I was much younger and, and, and learning how to do this. Use the inside of your hand right here. Okay. So if we're looking for medium rare, which is typically how we recommend eating that steak, you want to take the first two fingers, pinch them together like that. Press. All right, that's what your medium rare steak should feel like if you were to press on the side. One thing to remember, don't press on the top, okay? Because we've seared the top. You're gonna have that nice hard crust. All right, so if you press on the top, it's gonna feel much more done than it actually is. All right. Okay, our filet is nice and perfect. Let's go make our sauce now. We need, in the same thing, we sear our filet, we're going to deglaze. So before, it's good to add a little bit shallots, garlic, saute or caramelize a little bit to look a nice color and develop all the sugar from the shallots, you know, and the garlic color. You want to make sure you're using the same pan because you want all that black peppercorn that yep. came off of the steak. You want that little bit of oil that's flavored. All the fault, you know. Yep. All the flavor is there. It just we need to saute a little bit. You know, shallow is really uh, sugar, sugary. Uh, we need nice uh, flavor of the garlic. At now, it, at its core, this sauce yep. is just a dressed up pan sauce. We want to make a really nice, really rich and creamy uh, pan sauce with this. Now, let's go to add now. Some brandy. Be careful in this step. I used to, I like to at home, just turn it on, off, I'm sorry. Always turn off your heat before yeah. you add. Add like one or two spoon. Yeah, for killing. And that one, and then go to the bottle. You're not putting some kind of alcohol, it's just a flavor in the bottom of the pan, you know. Your alcohol doesn't catch on fire, that doesn't mean you did anything wrong. Yeah. Okay, you want to just let your alcohol, what we're looking for is what's called deglazing, okay? So we want to take all those little bits that are in the pan, and we want to get them up, and that we use that alcohol to do that. This was from Demi Glass. The Demi Gloss, okay? It's Demi, as in almost, and it's almost a gloss, okay? So a gloss is a really, really fine, almost syrupy stuff. It reduced to a point that it's syrup. Demi Gloss isn't quite that syrupy, but it is a reduced and fortified stock. All right, so in this case, we're going to use veal uh, or beef, demi gloss. Okay, and again, that's just a really nice, really concentrated beef sauce. You see now? Let's look at it. Close to three, a little bit more. So we, want to, we want to reduce this down until it's what we call demi set, almost dry. Okay, so you're going to reduce that down. All that demi gloss is going to keep reducing. It's going to get thicker. It's going to really start to fortify. And it's going to really incorporate all those ingredients. So that when Chef is ready, he's going to add that, that cream that really rounds this sauce out. Yeah. Gives it a little bit of fattiness. All right. Okay, let's see. And the food table is on. And again, you're incorporating something very cool into something very warm. So you want to make sure you're keeping your pan moving, all right, to ensure that it doesn't break. Nobody likes a broken sauce. Yep. So perfectly a nice. Let's try. Wow. Let's see a little bit more. Salt. Right, this, what, what 
time. Perfect. Okay, let's set aside. Now we're going to saute our Brussels sprout leaves. This is easy. I, I recommend doing the moment. Just take like a 30 seconds to do it. Nice hot pan. We'll put some salt, pepper, and garlic too. Let's wait for our pan to be really, really hot. Okay, uh, Matt, I like a uh, Brussels sprouts because I add crunchiness, you know, it's a, it's a strong flavor, a little bitter. Yeah, and, but, and Brussels but sprouts, like, uh, Brussels I like sprouts. a lot. And Brussels sprouts have changed a lot. These are the Brussels sprouts that we ate when we were a kid. The boiled little heads of cabbage that nobody liked eating, you know. We, we've really started treating Brussels sprouts like, like every other vegetable and they're getting a little bit more love and attention. Uh, and we're finding out, I think, much like cabbage and, and the things that we can do with cabbage, uh, how versatile Brussels sprouts are. And they are a, uh, they're great. Depending on how you cook them, they are a phenomenal side dish. Yeah. They can actually, you can use it like raffini, broccolini. I like rosotero radicchio, the bitterness too. Yep, it and it's good one. The nice thing with a lot of these bitter lettuces, bitter greens, uh, a lot of the bitterness will actually cook out of them as you bring it up in temperature. So you get a lot of that flavor without the bitterness. That's why uh, Valentine, Valentine's Day, then you use a little peppery yep. for flavors. For, for example, yep. here, here at the club, we have two items on the menu, uh, which both are based with bitter greens, and both of them, we cook them to remove some of that bitterness and really uh, accentuate some of the flavors uh, that we're looking for. So with our roasted Brussels sprout appetizer, you're cooking a lot of that bitterness out and we're incorporating a lot of rich and fattier flavors. And then again with our grilled romaine, which is kind of a play on the Caesar salad. Yeah. Romaine is a, a historically bitter lettuce. So by, by seasoning it and grilling it very quickly, you get that nice char and it does cook out a little bit of that bitterness. Okay, I think now our fry pan is ready. Put some oil. This is a really, really easy and fast step. Okay, let's have to wait for a one more second. When, when Chef says fast on this too, he means fast. This is, um, yeah, this is not something as, as, as crunchy and as good as these vegetables are. As crunchy and as good as these vegetables are, they will, uh, they will go, they will wilt very quickly. So when you put them in this hot pan, they're gonna start to brown on their edges. We season them and we pull them right off the heat. Okay, ready? Let's go to pull up. Nice, you can see? Nice, let's go to one now. Some salt. Nicely. Some chopped garlic. A little more salt. Start to wilt all the Brussels sprouts. Smell delicious. I think it's nice. You know, nice green or color filler. Start to be shiny, you know? You still want it to be a little bit crunchy. If yes. You lose the crunch, it's, it's just kind of almost like a lettuce. Don't let it die. You know? Now it's ready to go. Yeah, nice, wilted, crunchy, colorful. Let's see. Let's set aside. Now let's go to plate. Go to heat it up. Our sauce.
why not? Garnish with some greens on top. And now you can enjoy your steak apois.